Welcome to the internal medicine residency series dedicated to the interns. We're going to go over the 20 most common cases that you're going to see during your first year of training as an intern. Knowing these cases is going to make you rock your first year and impress everyone in your hospital. Today is your first day as an intern. Your senior resident calls you and gives you your first admission of the day. A 65 year old female with a past medical history of hypertension, DM, COPD on 2 liters of home oxygen and nocturnal BiPAP presence with shortness of breath for the past one day. She reports to have quit smoking one year ago, however, her friends still continue to smoke in her home. Patient has had multiple recent hospital admissions for the same presentation. Based on the history that you've received from the ER physician, you are going to go see your patient and start your admission. Now when you begin your admission, you must have a few differential diagnoses in your head before you approach the case. So for this patient who's coming in who has a history of hypertension, diabetes, COPD already present in the history, you must start thinking maybe this patient is coming with a COPD exacerbation. However, you should never ever just simply rule out the fact that there could be something else going on all right so for this case number one differential diagnosis is going to be COPD exacerbation however we must make sure you're not going to miss out on a CHF exacerbation maybe the patient has a pneumonia or the patient might be having a pulmonary embolism so these thought processes must be present when you go and see your patient all right you've completed the history taking from your patient and now you're going to move on to the physical exam which is a very important part for you as an intern you must examine your patients very very thoroughly all right so in this patient patient has a vital signs blood pressure 160 over 90 a heart rate of 105 respiratory rate 30 and a temperature of 99 degrees Fahrenheit all right and uh, the head ear nose and throat you see that the patient has a pink conjunctiva all right and the patient also has nasal flaring and a pursed lip breathing a pursed lip breathing looks like this all right that's very important for us to know all right respiratory system you have bilateral wheezing in both parts inspiratory and expiratory wheezing is present and apart from that you also have poor air entry the lungs are very very tight all right cardiovascular s1 s2 heard and you hear a loud p2 a loud p2 sound is heard all right and the lower extremities there is no evidence of pedal edema so based on the history and the physical examination findings that you had in your patient your diagnosis is most likely going to be yes perfectly right copd exacerbation all right COPD current findings is equal to COPD all right but however let's try to think of other things that could be also going wrong with your patient for instance if they told you your patient had a lot of crackles bilateral bibasilar crackles are present if the patient had an elevated jugular venous distension if the patient has got ascites and pedal edema now this is going to be pointing more towards CHF exacerbation very good CHF exacerbation however what if you got a case where the patient is going to be having very very clear lungs all right very clear lungs maybe a very mild fever the patient is tachycardic all right and has a modified well score of five what are you going to think of at this point it is going to be PE very good pulmonary embolism and now if you had another patient with a possible suspicion for a different condition when you're going to have a fever a lot of cough with the purulent yellowish greenish sputum coming out and on physical examination if you find more of a bronchial breath sound say for instance on the left lower lobe of the lung maybe a bronchial breath sound all right what are you going to think of at this point very good it's going to be pneumonia The purpose of this lecture is to talk about our main case of interest today which is COPD. However, I want you to make sure you keep your open mind. When you see a patient, don't always assume it's going to be COPD. They could have a multiple different concurrent things going on at the same time. However, we want to get to management of COPD. Based on your history physical examination, you already have your presumptive diagnosis which is COPD exacerbation. However, you must make sure you rule out all the other possible suspicions that you may have on this patient's case. 
case so the lab test let's start placing our lab orders so we're going to order a cbc reason we order a cbc is because you want to look at the wbc count because if the wbc count is elevated it's still going to tell you there's a potential chance for infection all right but the elevated wbc does not always mean infection alone elevated wbc could be present if the patient has been on home steroids steroids causes increased wbc that's number two number three is the fact that any form of stress response can also give you a rise in wbc so a rise in wbc suggests infection but does not always mean the patient must have an infection everything should uh, come together in order for you to confirm it is an infection next hemoglobin hemoglobin is important in this case because if the patient is a chronic smoker you will see polycythemia all right and this patient actually had a very pink conjunctiva if you recall the case next you're going to be looking at your cmp in the cmp you're going to be looking at your bun creatinine and all other electrolytes the reason you're ordering this test is to get a baseline estimation of what exactly is going on you want to know what the patient's creatinine is because a lot of times when the patients are admitted to the hospital for whatever reason something happens and something causes some component of acute renal failure acute renal failure will be dealt in a different topic but you should always anticipate it. it's always good for you to get a cmp as well as you want to monitor other important electrolytes such as your potassium calcium and magnesium all right next you want to also get a bnp reason being if you want to think of this case you think of a patient with shortness of breath and sometimes there might be a component where a patient actually has bilateral peripheral edema or maybe have some bibasilar crackles in this case it's very important for you to get a bnp level because if it is elevated it suggests that the patient probably has chf exacerbation along with it or it helps you uh, uh, rule out the possibility of there's no chf at all if bnp is very low however elevated BNP does not always strongly push you towards yes it is a CHF exacerbation sometimes people have elevated BNP levels that does not mean they are in acute exacerbation just because the elevated BNP is present all right number four I want you to get a, a arterial blood gas now the arterial blood gas on a patient with COPD exacerbation becomes crucial especially when you see the patient is having a lot of significant shortness of breath reason is this if you look at a patient with COPD exacerbation what do you think they're breathing like they're breathing very very fast they're going to be breathing like and when you do that what are you doing to your CO2 you're blowing it out you're blowing it out right if you keep blowing it out what would your PCO to be in your blood gas it will be low you will always have a more of a respiratory alkalosis picture all right now if I keep blowing it out and out and out <sighs> After a point, you're going to tire out. At this point, what's going to happen is your CO2 is going to start to accumulate. When it starts to accumulate, you're going to go into a more of a respiratory acidosis pattern. And this is important for you to know because this is the time you might end up having to put the patient in some form of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or even intubate the patient so an arterial blood gas becomes very very crucial in the management of copd however sometimes you can also get a venous blood gas if the patient is having a very mild exacerbation that's fine as well all right finally on this side you have a few other tests that you must get a pulse oximetry you want to monitor what the oxygen saturation in your patient is and again you don't want to get to 100 percent but in a patient with copd exacerbation if you can hit your treatment to a maintenance of blood uh, uh, oxygen saturation between 88 to 92 that's perfectly fine you don't want to get such high oxygen levels in a patient with copd it's okay 88 to 92 is totally acceptable in a patient with copd then chest x-ray is so crucial in the management of copd exacerbation reason is it tells you a lot of things number one if you get a hyper inflated lung flattening of the diaphragm seeing way low many ribs on your chest x-ray tells you the patient actually has emphysema which is part of copd now if you do see uh, an infiltrate present in one of the specific lobes or even multi-loba infiltrates it suggests pneumonia whereas if you have a bilateral congestion a very wet look of the lung with cephalization now this is more suggestive of 
CHFX exacerbation. And finally, if you have a very clear lung picture, if your chest looks completely clear, clear on the chest x-ray, but the patient is significantly hypoxic, you must immediately always rule out a pulmonary embolism. One of the most crucial tests is an EKG. The reason EKG is important is when somebody comes with shortness of breath with a lot of risk factors, you must get an EKG because this could just all in all straight up be a acute MI. So acute coronary syndrome must be ruled out. For that reason, you need to get an EKG. Also, if you look at an EKG, it does give you a lot of other information. Does the patient have a left ventricular hypertrophy? Maybe a right ventricular hypertrophy. Maybe the patient has pulmonary hypertension. Maybe you are going to see a specific very unique pattern which you do not often see in these cases but it is often tested upon s1 q3 t3 pattern which is seen in you're absolutely right in pulmonary embolism all right guys so these are the basic lab orders that you are going to place as an intern you're going to put orders for cbc cmp bnp a venous blood gas or an arterial blood gas and finally you're going to have the patient on a continuous pulse oximetry especially if it's moderate to severe copd exacerbation you must get a chest x-ray and you must order an ekg and i think i am missing one important test especially after i spoke about the ekg always get a troponin because this might as well always be an mi so never ever miss an mi guys it's so important all right now we are going to get into the most important part which is going to be your assessment and plan you studied all your life and became an intern for this part yes you want to get a beautiful history yes you want to do a complete physical exam you need to focus on the labs and now this is your assessment and plan this becomes your key component when you are an intern so your assessment now tells you the patient has a cop exacerbation so how are you going to manage them so let's talk about this this is i'm going to go over the current guidelines as to how you're supposed to manage but i'm going to give you a cheat sheet as to how you're going to place your orders in your patient's management so number one most important thing in a patient for uh, management of copd exacerbation number one is going to be bronchodilator therapy now bronchodilator therapy essentially means bronchodilator therapy you are going to use your short acting beta agonist and you're going to use your anticholinergic medications do you guys recall what your short acting beta agonists are yes albuterol and leave albuterol there are other medications as well such as perbuterol leave albuterol has less tachycardia as a side effect so for instance you have a patient who's having significant tachycardia you'd rather use leave albuterol now when you look at your anticholinergic medication you have your short acting which is going to be called ipratropium bromide Ipratropium bromide. So these are the two commonly used combinations. So basically in your hospital you'll always see a combination known as duo nibs. Duo nibs, right? It's dual nebulization therapy. Duo nibs. So when you look at your duo nib therapy, essentially what it is, it is a combination of albuterol plus ipratropium bromide and how you're supposed to use this medication if you look at the guidelines what it says you could use this albuterol in the form of a nebulization however often you want to but around one to four hours q1 to q4 hours okay whereas if a patient is much much more severe you can do it every 15 minutes however normally if a patient is coming to the hospital ward you're going to end up using it q1 hourly to q4 hourly whereas ipratropium bromide again you could use it every q4 hourly to q6 hourly so for all practical purposes what you could do is you can put an order for duanibs as q4 hourly standing dose plus a q6 hourly PRN now this works perfectly fine and feel free to adjust it however you want to all right but this is just a rule of thumb how you're going to use them all right so number one you wanted your bronchodilator therapy which must be ordered so you're going to order your duonips q4 hourly standing and q6 hourly PRN all right number two what else are you going to need the biggest component in fact is your steroid therapy very good you are going to need steroids let me ask you an interesting question 
you have a choice between PO steroids versus IV steroid. Which one is more efficacious? What do you guys think? If you're saying that it is IV steroids, it's not true. If you're saying oral steroids, it is also not true. Are they both equally effective? Absolutely yes. They are both equally effective. There is no difference in the efficacy of uh, uh, IV steroids when compared to oral steroids. However, so the dosing that you're normally going to use, if you're looking at prednisone, which is going to be oral, the maximum dose for the day is going to be 60 milligrams. So you could use 30 milligrams, 60 milligrams, 50 milligrams. It's totally up to you. Your daily dose should be a max of 60 milligrams. If you're going to be using IV steroids, IV steroids is going to be called methyl prednisolone and the dosing is going to be a 60 to 125 milligrams which could be used at least three to four times per day and again if you wanted a rule of thumb what you're going to do is you can choose IV uh, methyl prednisolone you could do 60 milligrams Q6 hourly or Q8 hourly or you could do 80 milligrams Q6 hourly or Q8 hourly either one works all right you guys can choose whatever formulation you want but the normal dosing is supposed to be between 60 to 125 Q6 um, or Q8 hourly all right so important thing to re realize here is that there is no difference in efficacy between your oral steroids as well as your IV steroids. They're equally the same. Uh, the question really is, when would you use IV steroids? When, when would you use oral steroids? If you cannot use oral steroids for whatever reason, for instance, the patient is in severe exacerbation using a lot of uh, respiratory muscles and whatnot and looks very dysnic, then you cannot use oral steroids. That becomes one indication, all right? And if the patient is in some form of shock and this is affecting your splanchnic circulation and as a result is gonna affect your absorption, then you wanna avoid PO steroids. So for whatever reason, you see the patient and you decide, okay, this person does not look like the person who's gonna be able to take PO steroids, then you're gonna use IV steroids, all right? And also if the patient has already been on home steroids and now the patient is coming a COPD exacerbation then patient has failed PO steroids so in this case as well you're going to place the patient on IV steroids very good so just to recap the first two important points in your management it's going to be duonibs and number two steroids anytime anywhere anybody asks you management of COPD what are the two big things duonibs and steroids all right the third component of your management of COPD exacerbation is antibiotics do you have to give a patient with COPD antibiotics there's no pneumonia there's no fever there's no white count there's no infiltrated chest x-ray do you have to give a patient antibiotics if you're thinking no it is not true you must give antibiotic to patients with COPD if they meet criteria now what criteria am I talking about right here all right if you want to have if you see a patient and your patient has increased dyspnea that's point number one if the patient has got increased volume of the sputum all right and number three is if the patient's got an increased purulence in the sputum so these are your three important points if you have two out of these three points increased dyspnea increased sputum purulence and increased sputum volume any two out of these three it becomes one important criteria for the patient to actually get antibiotics but not by itself you also need it to be a complicated COPD what do I mean by complicated COPD is is the patient age more than 65 is the patient having an FEV1 less than 50% of predicted does the patient have more than two exacerbations per year of COPD or does the patient have cardiac disease so if you have two out of the first three or any one of these together the patient becomes a candidate for antibiotics now the next big question really begins to ask is okay what kind of antibiotics are you going to use the simple it eventually all boils down to a simple question do you want to cover for pseudomonas or not what increases your patient's risk of pseudomonal infection these are the factors you must consider advanced COPD previous sputum positive for pseudomonas frequent hospital admissions frequent antibiotic use and systemic steroid use these are obviously 
easy points for you to remember and again if these points are present then you should start thinking that the patient must require coverage for pseudomonal infection so if it is a pseudomonal infection the antibodies you could possibly use are going to be cefepime or ceftazidim or levofloxacin these antibiotics are going to cover for pseudomonas whereas if you look at a non-pseudomonal infection you could use ceftriaxone you could still use levofloxacin or moxifloxacin however i'll let that part be for you to read by yourself for all important purposes antibiotic coverage in a patient with COPD now you know how to decide if you're going to give it or not do you have to give your patient oxygen who's coming with COPD exacerbation it all depends if the patient has a very mild uh, COPD exacerbation the person seated down and uh, you know has a little bit of wheezing but the patient is saturating at 98 percent in room air clearly you're not going to put this patient on oxygen however it's for the patient who goes into moderate or severe COPD exacerbation now you should start thinking okay am I gonna give this patient oxygen yes you are right the methods by which you can actually deliver oxygen from the least invasive to the most invasive so if you look at it number one is gonna be nasal cannula now there's important concepts that you must learn about nasal cannula nasal cannula can go all the way up to about six liters you can deliver about six liters of oxygen via the nasal cannula and what's the percentage of oxygen saturation uh, oxygen what percentage of oxygen you can deliver it's a maximum of about 40 percent there's a calculator online you can check it out you basically have to put in how many liters of oxygen you're giving via nasal cannula and that will tell you how many percent of oxygen that is number two what you can use is what is a little higher than a nasal cannula is gonna be your face mask now if you look at the face mask again it's a very loose mask that you're going to place on your patient and this can deliver almost six to ten liters of oxygen and you can get to a maximum fio2 of about 55 percent all right now if you want something even more stronger you're going to choose your non-rebreather mask now if you look at a non-rebreather mask this is gonna have a one-way stop valve with the collection of air outside in the face mask and it's very much uh, tight on the nose and the mouth and it's gonna deliver oxygen in a much more powerful way and with a non rebreather you can easily reach up to about 95% of FiO2 when you give a patient oxygen what is the saturation you're targeting you're targeting an oxygen saturation on a pulse oximetry to be between 88 to 92 you don't have to talk at 100% 88 to 92 is completely fine all right as an intern now you know how to manage COPD exacerbation you know your duonips bronchodilator therapy you know your steroids how much you're going to give your patient you know the antibiotic usage in a patient with COPD and last but not least you also know if you're going to give your patient oxygen and what's the target you're going to hit finally the big question this is what makes you uh, a resident this is what differentiates the boy from the men all right this is what differentiates you being a first year resident and a second year resident to a third year resident the question is when are you going to think the patient is so critical that now you're going to consider either placing a BiPAP or intubating the patient all right so if you look at a patient and he is looking like is in a lot of respiratory distress all right and there's a lot of accessory muscle use all right accessory muscle use you get an ABG and the ABG shows that the patient has a lot of PCO2 retention which is not supposed to be the case normally you're supposed to wash out co2 but if you're retaining co2 this means you're tiring out it's straight up you are tiring out so when this happens if your patient has a reasonable mental status the patient is still with it he's able to answer questions he's able to he, he you don't think that he's completely altered at that point you could still try a bipap you could still put the patient on a bipap BiPAP is a non-invasive positive pressure ventilation essentially it could be used as a 
uh, a preliminary uh, maneuver that you could do prior to intubation all right if this fails the patient is going to get intubated so you could always try the BiPAP now what is the number one and the most important contraindication using a BiPAP it is altered mental status if somebody's altered they cannot protect their airways should never ever put them on a BiPAP all right this is the most important thing you want to learn during your internship never put a patient on a BiPAP if the patient is completely altered all right however if the patient is altered at this point you should call the patient to be intubated once the patient is intubated now this is going to become the game for the ICU care all right so this basically sums up your management part of COPD exacerbation all right guys so this concludes our video on COPD exacerbation I kept it short with the history I kept it short with the physical exam because the most important part you want to learn as an intern is this part your assessment and plan what orders you're gonna place and what's the treatment you're gonna give for the most common conditions all right just to recap for you again this should be embedded in your brain for life from now on your treatment for COPD exacerbation is essentially gonna be bronchodilator therapy steroids antibiotics oxygen and always remember when you're going to call your senior in order to maybe place the patient on bipap or you need to intubate the patient thank you so much for watching please don't forget to subscribe and i'll see you guys in the next video which is on chf exacerbation